All the Young Dudes, Sirius's Perspective by Roller Coaster Words. Chapter 58, Fourth Year, Competition. Remus appeared to be in a marginally better mood by the time they all stepped off the train. At least, he'd agreed to come back to the carriage once Sirius had finished his cigarette, and he'd stopped scowling at everyone. But all of Sirius's hard work to cheer him up was almost immediately negated. There were only twenty minutes or so until sunset by the time they arrived at Hogsmeade, and Madame Pomfrey was already waiting for Remus at the station. "'Good luck, Mooney,' Sirius breathed as they parted ways, moving towards the horseless carriages with James and Peter. Remus gave him a grim nod, and then Pomfrey was seizing him by the elbow and dragging him away. It felt strange, attending the Hogwarts welcome feast without Lupin. Normally, the marauders delighted in watching him shovel seconds and third helpings of everything onto his plate, taking bets about how much he'd managed to eat. His seat remained conspicuously absent, and the marauders weren't the only ones to notice. "'Where's Remus?' Lily asked, sitting with Mary and Marlene a little ways down the table. "'Hi, Evans,' James said dreamily, at the same time that Sirius said, "'Oh, what's it to you?' Lily rolled her eyes. "'Remus is our friend, Sirius,' she said scathingly, ignoring James. "'I'm just asking why he isn't here.' Next to her, Marlene giggled nervously. "'He's in the hospital wing,' Peter piped up, and Sirius turned to glare at him. Lily's sarcastic expression immediately became concerned. "'Really?' she leaned forwards a bit. "'Why, is he all right?' "'It's private,' Sirius said, frowning reproachfully. "'If you're so curious, you can ask him about it when he gets out. "'But if you're his friend, maybe you should keep your nose out of his business.' Lily looked both mildly abashed and mildly irritated, clearly unsure of how to respond to this admonishment. But Mary just rolled her eyes, saying, "'All right, Black. No need to be so pissy about it. "'We can talk to Remus later. "'Come on, I've got to finish telling you about Darren.' The last bit was dictated to her friends, and the girls huddled closer as Mary lowered her voice. Sirius stabbed at his food with his fork, annoyed by the entire exchange. Leave it to Evans to go poking about when she should be minding her own business. Nothing had changed there. James sighed, watching her giggle with Mary and Marlene, and mumbled, You didn't need to be so harsh, mate. Well, she should mind her own business, Sirius grumbled, skewering a potato. Peter glanced back and forth between them anxiously. That night, after the others had gone to bed, Sirius carefully pulled out the yellowed newspaper clippings that Remus had given him. He unfolded them, casting a quick lumos and holding up his wand so that he could see. The Daily Prophet, April 1964 Werewolf attacks on the rise. Could your children be next? The Ministry of Magic has today confirmed that the recent spate of murders, both in the muggle and wizarding communities, is the work of dark creatures, namely werewolves. Ministry officials are particularly concerned that in many cases the victims of the attacks have been children under the age of 10. One official, respected dark creatures expert Lyle Lupin, has spoken out and criticised the ministry for lax and willfully neglectful safety measures. Lupin claims that the ministry's current werewolf registry is poorly managed and maintained, enabling certain anti-ministry factions to use loopholes to their advantage. The current number of victims is suspected to be 17, but set to rise as the investigation continues, and the predators continue to elude capture. A statement from the Aura's office is expected later today. The Daily Prophet, Obituaries, January 1965 Lyle Lupin, who has died aged 36, will be remembered as a world-renowned expert on non-human, spirituous apparitions. For his extreme work with boggarts and poltergeists, Dementor liaisons, and more recently, his efforts to reform the National Werewolf Registry. Lupin is survived by his wife, Muggle Hope Lupin, who he married in Cardiff in 1959. The couple have a young son, Remus John Lupin, born in 1960. The family has requested privacy during their time of grief. The Daily Prophet, February 1965. Aura's on lookout for Greyback. The Aura's office is appealing to the wizarding public for any information pertaining to the whereabouts of of Fenrir Greyback, werewolf and suspected child murderer. Greyback is described as 6'3", very strong and unclean, with the appearance of a vagrant. Wizards and witches are warned to not approach him and consider Greyback extremely dangerous, even in human form. Aura Moody today made a statement indicating that the Ministry believe Greyback to be travelling with a pack of werewolves. 
making him making him all the more dangerous. Rayback is known to have preference for small children, but Moody declined to comment on speculation that the werewolves planned to raise an army. The Ministry also declined to respond to all allegations that they had Greyback in their custody last spring and failed to recognise the threat. Since the death of Lyle Lupin, an outspoken advocate for harsher sanctions on werewolves, there have been numerous efforts to improve the recognition and registry of dark creatures. Sirius extinguished his wand, feeling vaguely ill. He had never given much thought about Remus's family. He knew his father had died when he was a child, and that he was estranged from his mother. He knew that Remus had lived in a boy's home, without ever seeing his relatives, but he had never really considered what it might be like, growing up alone in the world. Sirius had his own family problems to worry about, and Remus had never acted like it bothered him much. No one's entitled to an happy life. Remus had said that to him, almost a year ago. Sirius hadn't given the words too much thought, past accepting them as part of Mooney's typical, dreary outlook on life. But now, he thought about something else Remus had said, when Sirius asked about his father during second year. My dad, he, uh, well, he, he killed himself after I was bitten, so I suppose it was because of me. Could that have been true? If Lyle Lupin was an outspoken campaigner against werewolves, and his own son got bitten, Sirius felt a sudden surge of anger. How dare Lyle Lupin abandon his son? It was weak, cowardly, atrocious. How could he have left Remus, kind, intelligent, infuriating Remus, just because, what, he didn't want a werewolf as a son? It was despicable. If either of Remus's parents had stuck around long enough, they would have realised that they were lucky to have a son like Mooney, that they didn't even deserve him. Sirius wanted to tear up the stupid news clippings, but he didn't. Instead, he folded them carefully and set them aside, knowing he'd need to return to them. Still, he had trouble falling asleep that night. His body buzzed with anger at a man long dead, veins clogged with rage that had nowhere to go. Monday, the 2nd of September, 1974. Sirius! Sirius! Sirius groaned, rolling over in his bed. He cracked his eyes open, heavy with sleep, and yelped as he came face to face with James Potter. Blimey, mate, don't do that. James laughed, springing back from the mattress where he'd knelt, and shoved his head in front of Sirius's. Come on, up you get. What time is it? Time to go to the hospital wing. Sirius groaned again, pulling his blankets over his head. After an incessant amount of cajoling, lots of yawning, and increasingly and increasingly violent threats from James Potter, Sirius found himself blinking the sleep out of his eyes at the hospital wing. It was so early that they'd actually beaten Remus there. Madame Pomfrey was missing, presumably having gone to fetch the boy. Sirius eyed the empty beds longingly, but before he had the chance to decide whether it was safe for him to crawl into one, the doors swung open. Madame Pomfrey tutted when she saw them, but didn't immediately shoo them out. Remus emerged from behind her, grinning broadly. "'How'd James get you two up this early?' he asked, limping slightly as he moved towards them. "'It wasn't easy,' James told him, as Sirius stifled a yawn. "'I had to resort to threats of violence.' "'And actual violence,' Peter said resentfully, rubbing his arm. "'You okay, Mooney?' Sirius asked, forcing his eyes open. "'Fine. Cheers,' Remus nodded, allowing Madame Pomfrey to usher him away. The marauders waited as their friend undressed behind a screen, climbing into his usual bed at the far end of the ward. Five minutes, Madame Pomfrey warned, sleeping draught in hand. He needs rest, boys. We can't stay for long anyway, James assured her. Lessons and everything. We bought you a new timetable, Mooney. He passed the parchment over. Remus scanned the page eagerly, frowning. He glanced up and started to ask, Could you... We'll get your homework, Mooney, don't worry. Sirius interrupted him, smiling. Nice to see you back to normal. Yeah, Remus quipped, purposefully displaying a flash of claw marks on his arm. Can't get much more normal than me. The moon must not have been that bad. Remus was allowed to rejoin them for dinner, which meant Pomfrey didn't think he needed to be kept in overnight. He slipped into the great hall quietly, clearly trying not to draw attention to himself. And it might have worked, if not for the three eager girls that immediately rushed to tackle him into a hug. Sirius watched, 
unsure of whether he should be amused or annoyed, as Mary Marlene and Lily squealed, Remus! Lupin stared down at them with a look of fond confusion, wincing only slightly as they squeezed him. The girls started chattering, and Remus smiled as they led him to the table. I don't know how he does it, James said, sounding slightly awed. Just this morning, Evans was telling me that she'd rather drink powdered dung beetle shells than talk to me. Bloody ladies, man, Sirius muttered, trying to catch Remus's eye. When he succeeded, the other boy only gave him a helpless shrug, as if to say, what can I do? Seeing him sat next to the girls only emphasised how much Remus had changed over the summer. While he had always been tall, he now towered over them, even when sitting down, and he had to incline his head to make eye contact. The girls had grown taller too, but nowhere near as much as Remus, and besides, their growth spurts had occurred in more interesting places. Sirius found himself glancing, without even meaning to, at the way Mary's white school shirt pulled across her chest. "'Oi, ladies!' he called, when they showed no signs of releasing Remus. "'Can we have our Mooney back, please?' "'No,' Mary replied promptly, sticking out her tongue, and the marauders had to resign themselves to another Remusless meal. Once they were all back in their dorm room for the evening, James settled onto his bed, trying to look nonchalant. "'So, what were the girls talking about?' "'Oh, nothing interesting,' Remus shrugged, beginning to unpack his trunk. Boys, mostly, and snogging. Snogging? Sirius sat up. Since when did any of the girls snog people? Yeah, I know, Remus said, scrunching up his face as if the topic offended his delicate sensibilities. It's all they're interested in these days. Mary and her muggle boyfriend did something over the summer. What did they do? Sirius leaned forward, curious. He had already known that snogging was on the table. Were there other things they were supposed to start doing now, too? Uh, Remus faltered. Well, I don't know, really. Lily wouldn't let her talk about it when we were eating. Ah, James nodded proudly. Too clever for all that nonsense, Lily. How do you know it's nonsense? Sirius teased. It's not like you're doing any snogging. Oh, and you do, James shot back, frowning. I could if I wanted, Sirius reclined, smirking, arms behind his head. Plenty of girls fancy me. If you wanted, James scoffed. So what? You've got girls lining up for a cheeky snog, and you're just not interested. Sirius's stomach dropped. Yes. Was that strange? Was there something wrong with him? He'd assumed that, as he got older, he'd eventually understand what all the upperclassmen at Hogwarts seemed to go on about. But he still didn't quite get the appeal of mashing your lips with girls. But that was normal, right? Did James want to be snogging? Did Peter? Did Remus? He plastered on an impish grin. Jealous, are you, Potter? Ugh, of you. James made a disgusted face. Bet Lily fancies me, he said, wiggling his eyebrows. Take that back, James launched himself across the room, wrestling Sirius into a headlock as both of them laughed. Across from them, Peter sighed and exchanged a weary look with Remus. They were like this all summer, he said disapprovingly. Everything's a competition. For the second night in a row, Sirius lay awake, waiting for the others to drift to sleep. Once he heard the familiar sound of James's snoring and Peter's mumbled sleep talk, he slipped out of bed, creeping across the room. Mooney, you awake? He twitched the bed curtains aside, and Remus sat up, rubbing the sleep from his eyes. Yeah? Sirius crawled in, letting the curtains fall shut behind him. Remus scooted over to make room, looking confused and a bit apprehensive. He watched as Sirius settled himself on the mattress, sitting cross-legged, and pulled out his wand. Muffliato, he whispered, cloaking them in a silencing spell. What's up? Remus asked, stifling a yawn and squinting as Sirius lit his wand. The articles, he answered, pulling them out of his pyjama pockets. I read them. Oh, Remus shifted, looking uncomfortable. Right. I know you said you didn't want to talk about it, Sirius assured him quickly. But I just, well, I wanted you to know that I read them, I suppose. Okay, thanks. Remus nodded, looking embarrassed. And I understand why you're angry. Hmm? Anyone would be, Sirius leaned forwards, trying to find the right words. 
Ones that would make Mooney understand that he cared, that he wanted to help, that he thought Remus was brilliant and stronger than he had any right to be. It's... it's... it's just such a shitty hand to be dealt, Mooney. Remus blinked, staring at him, in a way that made Sirius feel like he'd swallowed his heart. I won't tell James, or Pete, he said quickly, not sure why he felt embarrassed. Not unless you want me to. No, please don't, Remus whispered. I'm not... I'm not ashamed. It's just private, you know? Sirius nodded gravely. It's safe with me. Remus smiled weakly and released a shaky sigh. God, you're so dramatic. Sirius laughed too. James's mum says I wear my heart on my sleeve. He nudged Remus with his toe. We can't all be master secret keepers like you, Mooney. I thought I wasn't me without secrets. Yeah, but if you have to have them, I'd rather that I knew. Remus shot him a look, brow raised. Because you're so special, Black. Cause, if I don't know, I'll just be trying to figure it out anyway. Like you and your little cigarette selling enterprise. He had the satisfaction of watching Remus's mouth fall open in shock. You looked in my trunk, you wanker. How dare you, Sirius stiffened, mock outraged. I would never stoop so low. One of the six-year lads came round asking for you, seeing if you were selling this year. It had been a stroke of luck that Sirius had forgotten to grab his transfiguration book that morning. When he'd run back to the Gryffindor Tower alone, the older student had stopped in the common room, revealing everything. Remus groaned, slapping his forehead. Was it Dirk Creswell? Bloody moron, that one. It had, in fact, been Dirk Creswell. How much do you make? Enough. Please don't tell James. You know what he's like about stealing. You stole them! Bollocks, Remus groaned, flopping back onto the mattress. I don't know how you do it, Mooney, Sirius marvelled. But you surprise me every time. Chapter 59, Fourth Year, September Classes began with all the usual fuss, professors lecturing about how this year was really crucial for their futures, Madame Pint scowling at the anxiety-ridden students that flocked into the library, increasing numbers of dirty looks from the upperclassmen trying to study in the common room when Sirius dared to challenge Peter to games of exploding snap in front of the fire. Potions was just as boring as usual, history was a dos, astronomy was mind-numbingly rote, in herbology, they were starting off with a unit on carnivorous plants, which at least was somewhat more interesting than usual, and Sirius could always count on McGonagall to provide challenging coursework in Transfiguration. Still, though, the professors warned that their schoolwork would only get more difficult. Sirius couldn't help but be disappointed at what was shaping up to be another year of drudgery. The older he got, the more he questioned whether classes were really so important as everyone would have him believe. Half the time, he thought he'd be able to accomplish more with an hour of unfiltered access to the library than an entire year of sitting and listening to his professors drone on. Their first divination lesson did nothing to dissuade him from this notion. They were beginning with Overmancy, which Sirius was pretty sure their professor had made up, despite her insistence that it was deeply rooted in historical practice, which originated in ancient Greece. For our first foray into the ovulant mysteries of the future, you shall be needing partners, she croaked at them, hauling her massive wicker basket of eggs onto her desk. When the old professor turned and peered at them from behind her shawls, seeing that none of them had moved, she flapped a gnarly hand at them. Go on, go on, pair up. Peter heaved a resigned sigh and stood to go find a partner as Sirius scooted his chair closer to James. He ended up next to Desdemona Lewis, a Ravenclaw girl with a slight overbite, who smiled cheerfully at him. Although Sirius was sceptical at first, he quickly decided that he had been too quick to judge Overmancy. Each pair was given a basket of eggs and told to practice finding omens using the keys in their textbook. The key question was a little more than a page of vaguely drawn blobs, each of which was supposed to mean something different. This left quite a bit of room for interpretation, and Sirius felt completely in his element, cracking his eggs open on top of his desk and trying to read his friend's futures in the splattered yolk. Let's see, let's see. He rubbed his chin thoughtfully, frowning down at the mess of yellow on their table. 
James rolled his eyes as Sirius clucked his tongue, saying, I'm afraid it's not looking good for you, Potter. Not looking good at all. It says here that Evans will never love you. You'll die a lonely old man, never having known the touch of a woman. Oi! James shoved his shoulder. Does not? Look, right there, that runny little bit. It clearly says that Evans is going to fall madly in love with me within the year. No, according to this bit of the key, it means he scanned the page and then gasped in horror. What? I'm so sorry, mate. He shook his head mournfully. It says here that you'll be bold by the time you're 30. They spent the rest of the class making increasingly dire and ridiculous predictions, stifling their laughter and trying to look serious whenever their shriveled professor tottered past. At the end of the lesson, they reunited with Peter. Sirius expected him to be resentful and withdrawn, as he often was when James and Sirius partnered up without him, and was pleasantly surprised to find that Pete seemed instead to be in just as a good mood as the rest of them. Remus, on the other hand, was very decidedly not in a good mood when they found him in the Gryffindor Tower. Even though they were hardly three days into classes, he was already acting as if exams were right around the corner, a prefect actually had to chase them out of the common room before Mooney would agree to go up to bed. You're being too taut on yourself, Sirius said, nudging his shoulder. It's the beginning of the year. If you're going to fuck up, you may as well fuck up now. Remus glared back. Easy for you to say. Some of us actually have to do work for our grades. Plus, it's the owls next year. I can't drop my standards now. Sirius rolled his eyes, irritated. He was just trying to be nice. Remus was starting to sound like Lily Evans. He'd always known she was a bad influence. All that studying, shut up in the library, with his gaggle of girls, was damaging Mooney's brain. Ugh, please don't mention owls. James cut in, darting a nervous glance between the two of them, that he probably thought was subtle. McGonagall and Flitwick had already put the fear in me. And why did we decide to do divination? I quite like divination, Peter mused, dumping his pile of books at the end of his bed. Prophecies and that? It's exciting. It's nonsense, Sirius said, a little more sharply than he intended to. You only like it because you're good at astronomy. It's not just that, James said slyly, as he pulled his pyjama shirt over his head. Noticed that Pete's got a new partner this year. Oh, yes, Sirius smirked. The divine Desdemona Lewis of Ravenclaw. Peter blushed bright red from head to toe. Shut up, he mumbled, retreating into his bed. She's just a friend. James, Sirius said gravely. What on earth are we going to do if Petey Boy here gets a proper snob before any of us? Well, your reputation will be in tatters for one thing, James answered, matching his solemn tone. What do I have if not my reputation? Sirius grinned as he climbed into his own bed, reclining on top of the pillows. Remus huffed loudly to ensure that they all knew what he thought, and to ensure that they all knew that he thought that they were acting ridiculous. For extra emphasis, he snapped open his book and yanked his bed curtain shut. Sirius frowned. Evans was definitely rubbing off on him. Of course, if I get a snog before you, that wouldn't hurt. James said. I'm on the Quidditch team. You don't have my animal magneticism, Sirius replied promptly, with a haughty flip of his hair for good measure. James's response came in the form of a pillow, thrown at high speed, with a startling accuracy at Sirius's head. Oi! I bet you, James grinned mischievously. Oh no, Peter moaned. Please don't. I bet you ten galleons that I can get a girl to snog me within a month. Ten, Peter gasped. Done, Sirius responded immediately. Just you wait, Potter. Remus huffed once more from behind his curtains, making sure that they all understood his absolute disapproval of their antics. Privately, Sirius was a bit relieved. If Mooney had decided to join in on the bet, he almost certainly would have won. Though instead... (laughs) <laughs> Privately, Sirius was a bit relieved. If Mooney had decided to join in on the bet, 
If Mooney had decided to join in on the bet, he most certainly would have won. Though he insisted that they were all just friends, Mary, Marlene and Lily seemed to follow him around like lost puppets, and Sirius had his suspicions that it wasn't quite as platonic as Remus might claim. It wasn't as though he didn't get it. Mooney was certainly very tall, and Sirius supposed that girls might like the little freckles dusting his skin, or the warm autumn brown of his eyes, or the whole broody, mysterious, tragic hero shtick that he had going on. So really, it was lucky that Remus had decided that he was above such trivial pursuits as snogging. In fact, it was quite funny, watching him purse his lips like someone's great aunt any time the subject came up. With Remus out of the running, Sirius was entirely confident in his ability to win their little bet. James had made a fair point of being on the Quidditch team, but he was completely hung up on Evans. Knowing Potter and his strict sense of loyalty, he wouldn't snog anybody but Lily, even if ten galleons were on the line, and Sirius had complete faith in Lily's ability to avoid the lips of one very desperate Quidditch star. As for Peter, well... It hardly even merited consideration. When it came to snogging, Sirius was sure that Pettigrew would pose absolutely no threat. Though Remus continued to insist that they were all being ridiculous, Sirius was quite happy to have the snogging bet occupying his attention over the next few weeks. They all needed something to distract them from the darkening atmosphere around them. As the war had previously felt so far from the castle walls, began insidiously to worm its way into Hogwarts. The Slytherins had always been cliquey, over-preoccupied with blood statters and looking down their noses at the rest of the student body. But there was a distinctly malicious twist to their huddled groups and distant demeanours this year. They roamed the halls in ominous packs, and Sirius began to notice that muggle-born students had taken to moving in groups as well. Teachers were more present in the hallways, eyeing students as if to ensure that nobody tried anything during passing periods. Of course, the professors couldn't be everywhere at once, and more often than not it was up to the students to defend themselves and each other. The marauders took up this role with gusto, swapping out pranks for protection. Where are the bloody prefects when you need them? James griped, following a rapid-fire series of engorgio charms aimed at a group of sixth-year Slytherins who were tormenting a first-year Hufflepuff. The older students were currently scurrying away, wincing and clutching their rapidly swelling extremities. I think the prefects are scared, Sirius drawled, leaning against the wall and watching as James helped the Hufflepuff to his feet. Cowards. All they can do is hand out detentions and take house points, Remus pointed out, and I don't think the Slytherins even care about those anymore. I heard Morsaba last week, saying that they should put up with their trivial punishments for the promise of a greater reward. Mulciper said that, Sirius raised an eyebrow, trying not to look too disturbed. It sounded eerily similar to something his parents might say. Bloody hell, he's more eloquent than I gave him credit for. Yeah, or he's parroting back something someone else has told him, James said darkly, watching the Hufflepuff hurry towards the kitchens. What do you think the reward is? Peter mumbled, scuffing his toe on the flagstones. Money? Power? Life eternal? Sirius sighed as he rolled away from the wall, stepping with an extravagant swagger up the corridor. Godric knows. They won't get it, though. Why not? Because, Petey boy, we're going to win. By the end of September... None of the marauders had gotten a snog. Sirius insisted that he was in the lead, as a few girls had shown interest, including someone named Effie Scunthorpe in Remus's Care of Magical Creatures class. But he had determined that none of them were quite up to par. Ten galleons was all well and good, but if he was going to snog a bird, he had to make sure that she was up to snuff first. He had a reputation to maintain, after all. And it, was entirely, and it was entirely reasonable to hold off. Plus, Sirius told himself, it wouldn't have been any fun to go and win the bet too easily. James was an excellent competitor at most things, Quidditch, exam grades, exploding snap, but he was hardly much of an opponent when it came to snogging. As predicted, he was entirely hung up on Lily, 
and had decided that if he was going to kiss someone, it had to be Evans. The result was that James had begun to make even more of a fool out of himself whenever the redhead girl was nearby, which Sirius might have thought was impossible had he not been able to witness it with his own two eyes. It was best in potions, where the extra attention James was giving Lily clearly drove Severus, who hunched over his cauldron, grimacing from behind his greasy tendrils of hair, mad. Give us a snog, Evans, James shouted during every first lesson, earning a death glare from Snape and an eye roll from Remus, who was standing next to Lily at their cauldron. The two of them had partnered up again this year, which Sirius filed away as more evidence that Remus was quickly becoming the heartthrob of Gryffindor Tower. Unfortunately, Lily seemed to be just as horrified as her glaring Slytherin friend. She swished her wand fiercely through the air, causing James and Sirius's cauldron to flip and spill the entirety of its contents onto their heads. For the next week, the boys were stained bright blue. But James was nothing if not temptatious. Once the dye had worn off, and he was back at it again. Once the dye had worn off, he was back at it again. This time, he consulted his father. Monty helpfully suggested that his son might try complimenting the girl he claimed to be head over heels for, and James marched into Slughorn's classroom, ready to try this new strategy. "'I really like your hair,' he said, brimming with confidence. The moment he caught sight of Lily approaching her workbench, "'Hmm,' she hummed, not bothering to even glance his way. Sirius snickered. "'Yeah, it's so, um, ginger.' There was a pause. Then Lily turned to James with a serene smile. Like it that much, do you? She asked sweetly. Sirius wasn't fooled. His eyes were on Remus, who had taken a careful step back. Sirius followed suit, not wanting to end up in Evan's blast zone. James, on the other hand, was so focused on Lily that he failed to notice his friend's subtle movements. He nodded fervently, delighted with the attention, and began to speak. "'Oh, yeah, I think it's Rufusio. Lily whispered, wand darting sharply in her hand. Sirius couldn't help the startled burst of laughter that jumped from his mouth. Even Remus appeared to be holding back a laugh. Half the class turned to look, alerted by the noise, and James stared about in confusion, which only sent Sirius into a fit of giggles that left him breathless. Finally, Marlene took pity on the poor boy and handed him a compact mirror. James's eyes went as wide as saucers, as he exclaimed as his mop of now bright red hair. Sirius spent the next two days calling James every rude nickname he could think of, and there were quite a few catcalls of ginger nut and carrot top. Still, James was undeterred, firm in his adoration for a certain muggle-born witch. Just got to be patient, he murmured dreamily, running a hand through his tangled auburn locks. Nothing worth having isn't worth waiting for. It's kind of impressive, Sirius Stage whispered to the other marauders. I sort of don't want to win the bet, because he's made it too easy. Yeah, James snorted. That's why. Oh, suck it, Coppernob. 